welcome to Cats Week. I'm Annalise Poorman. During the March 5th COVID-19 press conference, Monroe County Health Administrator Penny Cottle reported over 1 million doses of the COVID-19 vaccination have been given in Indiana and that 13,000 people are fully vaccinated in Monroe County. She said the County Vaccination Center will be transitioning to a new location at Indiana University. We've been talking about IU's willingness to set up a public site uh, and a transition. So we are beginning to transition uh, to IU for vaccinations that will begin next month. The convention center is open for first doses through March, and we will complete those vaccinations for anybody who needs a second dose that is vaccinated initially at the convention center, they will get their second dose of vaccine at the convention center. But we are making that transition so that IU will be um, the new kind of county uh, location. And we will then in April decommission the convention center site. Cottle said the move was due to capacity limitations. She also said that a mass vaccination clinic scheduled to be held at Notre Dame University will be using the single-dose Johnson & Johnson vaccine. But on March 26th and 27th, there's another mass vaccination clinic scheduled for the University of Notre Dame. So it's not for them, it is at, on their campus. Um, again, you need an appointment. Uh, they're available on that vaccine map. Cottle said teachers can now receive their vaccinations through Kroger, Meyer, Sam's Club, or Walmart. IU Health South Central Region President Brian Shockney said visitors would now be allowed inside of the hospital. I'm excited to share that beginning Monday, March 8th, all of IU Health hospitals will begin allowing visitors for all COVID-19 patients. Now, COVID-19 patients will be able to designate two close contacts uh, for visitors during their stay, and one of these two designated visitors will be able to visit per day. We are limiting the times and the visitation for the time being. Uh, we have additional measures in place to ensure that everyone is safe, including uh, our caregivers. But we do know that uh, the presence of visitors, the presence of family is important to the recovery. Shockney said the IU Health Medical Arts building will remain a vaccine site. Ellettsville Town Manager Mike Farmer proposed the disposal of a surplus street department trailer during the March 8th Ellettsville Town Council meeting. Uh, we have a new trailer that's a, board, a Department of Public Works trailer, and it's uh, up to date with all the new safety features and lights and everything. So we just do not need this property anymore. Um, we'd like to just take some bids and uh, see that it leaves. Farmer mentioned a $2,000 reserve on the trailer and said that the older model was outdated for their current uses. Um, it's a bit lightweight for our newer backhoes. And like I said, it's so old that um, for safety's sake, we just don't use it anymore. Um, somebody might be able to take it and um, uh, had time to rehab it and use it for their personal use. It, it'd be a good trailer, but um, for what we use it for, it's just served its purpose. I'm almost sure it's at least two to three decades old. Deputy Clerk Amber Wright said a bid period would be open for the trailer until March 19th. Council members unanimously approved the transfer. The Bloomington Plan Commission presented amendments to the Unified Development Ordinance during their March 8th meeting. Development Services Manager Jackie Scanlon said duplexes would be allowed in more places than triplexes and quadplexes. She said plexes are an integral part of a growing community. You know, we, we do think that they're necessary. Uh, we do think that they are part of a larger, um, part of a, a larger plan to uh, help increase um, housing in the community, um, help uh, um, have more land available, the existing land, existing infrastructure available to more people. But we understand that people are very concerned about um, the uh, character of existing areas. And so in this way, by making them all conditional and limiting where the more uh, intense uses are, uh, we hope to strike a balance there.
Scanlon spoke about the six conditional use requirements developments must meet, such as not destroying historical areas or areas of significant importance or produce large amounts of smoke, noise, or light. Commission member Brad Whistler said the commission would consider which district zones would permit Plex housing developments on March 25th. Citizens climate lobbyist Lee Amon requested an endorsement for carbon pricing legislation from the Bloomington Commission on Sustainability. During their March 9th meeting, Amon said the legislation was titled the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. First, um, a fee is imposed on fossil fuels at the point of extraction, that is, uh, for coal, oil, and gas uh, at the mine or wellhead. Uh, the, the price that's imposed the first year is $15 per CO2 ton equivalent. And every year after that, it's increased by $10 a ton. So it starts slow. And we believe it's important to start slow so that businesses and individuals can sort of come up to speed on the idea the prices are increasing, uh, but it, it ramps up the price quite quickly. And by 2030, the price would be in the range of about $120 per CO2 ton equivalent. Amon said all net revenue would be returned to households. He said each adult in a household would receive one share and each child one half of a share to offset the carbon fee price. He said border adjustments would also regulate import and export carbon taxes. That is to protect businesses, our U.S. businesses, so that if our businesses produce products and export them to a country without a carbon tax, they will be at a disadvantage because the price of their manufacture will be higher. So they would actually get compensation for those exports. Conversely, if we import products from countries without a carbon tax, we would impose a tariff to make up the difference, again, to protect uh, the U.S. businesses. Amon said the act could serve as a protection for low-income families where two-thirds of the U.S. families would break even with their shares. He said economic modelers have shown the act is not projected to harm the economy. GDP will be about even. Jobs will be about even. Uh, although we think jobs might actually be increased a bit and all while stabilizing the climate and bringing about a uh, uh, health benefits. Amon requested formal endorsement and a written letter of support to be sent to Representative Trey Hollingsworth, Senator Todd Young, and Senator Liz Brown. Commissioner Colin Murphy had two concerns with the legislation. That um, it pretty um, explicitly will bar the EPA, so our National Environmental Protection Agency, from regulating greenhouse gas emissions for the next 10 years. And so I, I think that this is quite concerning because regulating GHGs is one of the EPA's primary functions in the age of climate breakdown. Um, the second reason why I think it's concerning is because you know, like according to the world's highest science, climate scientific body, the International Panel on Climate Change, we have roughly eight to 10, maybe maximum 10 years to make incredibly large, deep, transformative changes to every aspect of society um, to reverse the climate crisis, right? The kind of changes that are required now are um, almost, they, they like go beyond the World War II mobilization efforts. Commissioner Alicia Hardy mentioned a portion of the legislation also restricted anyone from suing fossil fuel companies. She said the details of the bill were just as important as the carbon fee and dividend. Commissioners will debate their support during their April 13th meeting. The Monroe County Council considered a salary ordinance amendment regarding the county financial director at their March 9th meeting. Auditor Catherine Smith said the financial director would move from a 35 to a 40-hour-a-week work schedule.
the real bottom line issue is 2020 was a hard year. It didn't end in 2020, it bled over into 2021. So I was hoping the COVID stuff would pass, CARES and all that would pass. And then, then maybe with the second time through with Gatsby Gap, it would work out to be 35 hours because she's extremely sharp individual. You guys know that she's pretty much amazing actually. And uh, so I was hoping that it would work out. However, when we went through the Gatsby Gap, it, the hours that they predicted it would take, the State Board of Accounts, it took like five times that many hours. And that's even with a contractor um, helping us. Smith proposed covering the additional hourly expenses of approximately $8,500 annually with the auditor's ineligible fund. County Attorney Margie Rice said it is not illegal to have an exempt employee work over 40 hours a week. She spoke with Smith about additional compensation for overtime. The Department of Labor does not regulate between 35 and 40 hours. The Department of Labor only regulates over 40 hours. So again, um, the Department of Labor won't even look at matters really between 35 and 40 in terms of you know, overtime or comp time. But I, I thought my conversation with you, Margie, last fall was if it's regular and every single week, um, that that's a different story. Nope, not if you're, nope. If you're exempt, uh, the exempt status means that by the nature of your job, it's a professional job and, um, and you're not required to pay overtime compensation. And again, I'm not saying that that has no bearing on sort of the question that's on the table about switching this to 40 hours. That's totally a policy call. I'm just addressing the legal issue, which is exempt employees. You know, I'm an exempt employee. I can work 60 hours a week and I'm not entitled to additional compensation. Smith said the contractor would be phased out and the financial director's workload would increase. Council member Eric Spoonmore expressed concern for the increased workload. That there is real concern from council that one particular employee is now going to have a 120 hour work week. Jim, and so that's not. something, and that's a lot, and we want to keep and retain our high performing uh, uh, employees, and uh, we don't want them to get burned out. So I think let's yeah. talk about what the next steps might look like so to avoid that, and we can work together as a team to come up with a solution. I think that's what I'm hearing. Smith said a second person to assist with the job is needed. Council members unanimously approved the salary ordinance amendment. The Bloomington Arts Commission spoke about the development of a new Black Lives Matter street mural. Assistant Director for the Arts, Sean Starowitz, said the project was a Banneker Center Advisory Council-led project. He mentioned the two artists who designed the mural during their March 10th meeting. We have uh, secured some funding to support uh, involving um, Christina Elam again and Raheem Elmore for, for uh, the kind of like layout. Um, so the idea is it will be April 17th in the afternoon. I know that will be a busy day because we'll also have the trades garage. So um, we'll be in touch, but Banneker's really kind of leading the charge on that. Starowitz said volunteer signups would be available to help paint the mural. The mural will be located on 6th Street in between North College Avenue and North Walnut Street. Monroe County Commissioners considered the approval of a racial justice data project with Indiana University during their March 10th meeting. Prosecutor Beth Hamlin said the project was initiated by Prosecutor Erica Oliphant. Erica Oliphant, as Monroe County Prosecutor, is committed to identifying any racial and ethnic disparities that arise from prosecutor, prosecutorial practices in Monroe County and reforming policy and practice to mitigate disparate impact. Hamlin mentioned the project would track and evaluate prosecutorial decision making. She said data would be collected from multiple sources. There's $10,000 allocated for data, uh, like specified um, data reporting from both the prosecutorial case management system, the Odyssey system, and possibly from Quest, which is the, pro or the uh, probation system. Um, Dr. Graman and his team have worked a lot with probation. So they're 
familiar with um, the Quest system and we expect to be able to gather the data. It's just going to be time consuming, I believe. We've had some initial meetings about how we're going to do that. Project leader Dr. Eric Grauman mentioned the data would be collected from private justice record systems. He said there was a backup plan if electronic files were unobtainable. We are prepared, let's say worst case scenario, that uh, we cannot pull electronic records uh, very easily. We have a team who is very happy to sit in the basement of the prosecutor's office and go through uh, hard copy records to create a database of old records and then set up a system essentially that would allow us to have those records into the future as well. Commissioner Penny Giffins asked what data gathered from victims would look like. Grauman said surveys or focus groups would capture their experiences. We're going to be extremely careful. We've worked with survivors in the past with different projects uh, in different jurisdictions so we understand the caution that is needed there. So we'll be relying on uh, the prosecutor's office is um, a victim team uh, to help us create contact and only allow those folks who want to speak to us to speak with us. The project totaling $68,000 was unanimously approved by the commissioners. Senior zoning planner Eric Grulick presented a district ordinance amendment and preliminary plan for a development at 300 West Hillside Drive. Grulick said the location is an old warehouse on the Beeline Trail across from Switchyard Park. Um, so the petitioner is requesting to amend uh, the Thompson PUD for this parcel uh, to allow for the site to be redeveloped um, with several new buildings. Uh, this would include four townhome buildings on the north side of the site, uh, two mixed-use buildings on the south, south, south side of the site, uh, and then another building on the south side of Hillside Drive uh, that would contain two floors of parking with apartments above. Grulick said the townhomes would be three stories tall and include 19 living units with surface parking. He said the two multi-use buildings would be five stories tall with ground level business and about 32 apartment units each. Grulick said the parking garage and apartment building would also be five stories tall. Um, so basically it was approved as a four story building along the McDowell neighborhood to the west uh, with a requirement that the fifth story be stepped back 15 feet to allow for a maximum five-story building, 65-foot height. Um, so the bottom two floors of that building would be used for parking, uh, not just for this building or the residences here, um, but also to fulfill certain parking arrangements, uh, lease agreements that the petitioner has made with some adjacent property owners. Grulick said the development included multiple pedestrian connections to Switchyard Park and Rogers Street and that a roundabout would facilitate emergency vehicle access. Uh, there's a roundabout that is shown uh, kind of in the center of the site. Uh, the reason for that roundabout is actually to facilitate emergency vehicle access. Uh, emergency vehicles, specifically fire trucks, uh, can't go more than I believe 300 feet or so into a site without a turnaround. So that roundabout allows for traffic uh, fire trucks in order to be able to navigate and uh, exit the site should they have to enter in the, uh, the parking area. Committee member Stephen Voland questioned petitioner Doug Bruce about the usage of parking spaces. Bruce said the parking should remain under 0.5 spaces per unit and the surface lots would be posted as resident and customer only parking. Councilman Matt Flaherty asked Bruce about green roofs. I don't envision that this, this, that all of these buildings, certainly not the townhomes, are going to have a live roof on them. Uh, but these will certainly be roofs that will uh, reduce heat island effect. Uh, if we can, uh, it would be nice again to gain points and do uh, live roofs on the multifamily type buildings. Certainly, the building on lot four is going to be a little more. Uh, adaptive to that because I'm thinking that, that that space on top of the parking, the second floor of the parking garage, that the two residential units or, or strut floors look out into could be something because it's kind of U shaped. So I, I think that's going to happen. Um, I hope. Again, I can't guarantee what point someone is going to pick on, uh, depending on how this gets developed. I would also say as far as drainage, what we've thought of and what you see in the middle of this site 
is uh, kind of, I'll say a rain garden, but an area to take an, all of our uh, uh, stormwater drainage and take it to the middle of this site in an area that we can either hold on to it or reuse it in some ways. Community member Elizabeth Ash relayed her concerns regarding added traffic creating congestion on Rogers Street and Grimes Street. Bloomington Environmental Commission Chair Andrew Gunther said the development does not align with the Climate Action Plan. Council members continued their discussion to the next Land Use Committee meeting. The Monroe County Stormwater Management Board considered a Memorandum of Understanding for $1,000 with the Lake Monroe Water Fund Task Force during their March 10th meeting. MS4 coordinator Kelsey Fitonia said the donation would initiate an education and outreach program. I required in the MOU a education outreach plan so that they outline exactly what they will be using the funds for to make sure it aligns with our stormwater programs, um, I guess priorities. Uh, we already have our stormwater quality management plan for the MS4 program that has an education outreach component. So. Um, We'd like to see what they plan to use the funding for to make sure it is an appropriate use of our stormwater funds. Thetonia said the funds would be available until the end of 2021. Board member Penny Githens asked Task Force member Jane Martin what the education was for. Is education here about raising funds or what, what exactly is education going to cover, I guess? Is that for me? Yeah. Yes. Um, we uh, have gotten conditional approval from uh, the City of Bloomington Utilities to include an insert on why a water fund is important, what is a water fund, driving people to our website and providing boxes and essentially making the case. So that will be part of the education program that will start May 1st. Uh, Vic Kelson has asked us to delay it a month. So the month of April, our website will go live. We will begin a partnering strategy with corporate uh, customers and institutions and a media campaign. And um, this will be ongoing really for the, the remainder of this year. Martin said Lake Monroe was built to last 100 years and needs preservation work. She said the education would inform people on the importance of contributing to their water fund. Board members unanimously approved the MOU. The Monroe County Board of Health debated COVID-19 regulations concerning guests at communal living facilities. Monroe County Health Administrator Penny Cottle explained the existing regulation. The board will continue to prohibit non-essential guests, including members of the facilities organization who are not currently slated to live in the facility. Essential guests are those who are providing a professional service to the facility. Guest logs shall be maintained. Each facility shall adhere to the gathering sizes and all the board's regulations. Um, virtual gatherings are highly encouraged and recommended. Christian Student Fellowship House Director Bill Kirshner requested the board allow 15 guests outside of the communal living building. Board member Ashley Craner said she would not want to see more than 15 people outdoors together, including house residents. Board member Carol Litton to Luke and expressed her support for the change. That was part of the fun of spring and on IU's campus. I mean, it was, we really enjoyed those sort of things. And I, and I think that it, there's some like, significant mental health issues that have been going on with all the stress with this this year. And it's a very small thing we can do that might, you know, as Dr. Wren said, you know, something to look forward to that you could actually do that you haven't been able to do. And um, and again, I'll, if you want to limit it to, to Five instead of fifteen, I, you know, whatever, but uh, but it, it doesn't require change. It, it really doesn't, unless you want to add that. It doesn't require change in regulation. It just means defining the facility as the as the actual building, not the lawn. You don't actually have to change anything to do that. Board members deferred the decision regarding outside guests to Cottle and Monroe County Health Officer Dr. Thomas Sharp in collaboration with Indiana University officials.
During their March 11th meeting, the Bloomington Historic Preservation Commission discussed the restoration of a commercial storefront damaged by an automobile accident. The building is located at 118 South College Avenue. Historic Preservation Manager Connor Hederick spoke about the reconstruction. Uh, the petitioner is requesting to replace uh, this original bronze uh, metal storefront framing uh, with a bronze rub anodized aluminum product. Uh, they'll be keeping the, the, the header here uh, or the cap, but they will be replacing the vertical pieces and the, the lower sill portion um, with this uh, anodized aluminum product. And they will be installing, I believe, quarter inch thick uh, tempered glass. Um, they will also be uh, replacing this broken piece of limestone here. Um, and then they will be removing an unoriginal door that was added. I can see it better in this photograph uh, here. You can see a door. Um, they're gonna be removing this unoriginal door and restoring it back to the 120 South College storefront, uh, which is what this one looked like. Um, so they're gonna mirror the uh, plate glass dimensions from the 120 College storefront to the new one that they're, they're going to be restoring. Hederick said the original bronze was too difficult to source and replace. Board members unanimously approved the restorations. And that is all for Cats Week. Thank you for joining us. For Cats and WFHB, I'm Annalise Poorman.